I'm such an orthopod. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so there's um, a lot of kids and young athletes who are misdiagnosed, mistreated, and I love being able to talk to you early in your career so you could help pick this stuff up. Here's my boring disclosures. If anyone wants to name up there, give me some money later. Um, so spondies, 6% of the population. Most people don't even know they have a spondy. You know, it's only a problem when it's painful. Um, and in my practice, you know, we found out, actually not just my practice, but all of LA, it's typically delayed six to nine months to diagnose a spondy, you know, once they see a, a doctor. And frequently MRIs don't pick it up. So just think very simply here, if someone bends backwards and it hurts around L5, they have a spondy until proven otherwise, or a posterior element fracture. So we see this particularly in gymnasts, you know, football linemen that gets pushed backwards. 17% of D1 athletes or D1 pitchers are hot on bone scan for a spondy. And it could not only be a spondy, but also facet fractures. Facet fractures are under-recognized. Uh, they're often missed on MRI. They're missed on a bone scan. Um, you only see them on a CT or a bone MRI. Treatment is simple. You just pull it out. It's like pulling a piece of sand out of your eye. Want to do it sooner than later prior to having joint destruction. And we've shown that in kids that have facet fractures, pull them out. They pretty much feel better instantly and could return to sports in about a week. And above all, though, if you have a spondy, no pain, no problem. You know, here's a kid that had an entire Olympic gymnastics career with a spondy. She didn't have any pain. She had to go doctor shopping. The first five doctors told her she couldn't do gymnastics, but of course she could. Um, so here's a study showing that more than half the time when kids had a proven spondy on CT, the MRI missed it. And any time I present this, someone goes, well, if you do the correct sequences, you know, so we redid the study five years later, and sure enough, you know, 20% of MRIs were still missing spondies. So just accept that as true, please. So what's new? There's something out there called a bone MRI. That's proprietary. There'll be new things by different names, where you run a MRI, about an eight-minute sequence, and basically a CT comes out. It's accurate within one millimeter. There's no radiation. I think the big game long term is you're even going to be able to program this into computers and nav. So all of a sudden, not just saving radiation in kids, but adults as well. Now, if there's no role anymore, to get oblique views or Scotty dogs, you know, to diagnose spondies. If someone's doing that, they shouldn't be treating kids. And while the adult world all the time does, you know, flexion extension, there's no role for that in kids. It doesn't change the surgery. It doesn't change anything. Minimize x-rays in kids. So how do we treat these kids? First off, keeping someone out of sports for three months oftentimes takes the pain away. Doesn't always fix the bony defect, but it takes the pain away, and we won. However, if the MRI is not hot, or the bone scan is not hot, these rarely heal. It basically means you have a non-union. So let's uh, take a walk back. This is gonna sound a little bit different. If a kid breaks his arm, what do we do? Put him in a cast, let it heal. What do we do if a kid breaks their spine? We say, hey, why don't you just hang out for a few months and see if it gets better? You know, by the time you have a non-union, it's more difficult to fix. So treatment, bracing does not influence outcome. Now everybody sends someone to PT and bracing, because that's what we've all been taught. There's no evidence that that helps. And really study after study shows that bracing doesn't help. And there's some biomechanical studies showing that if you put a kid in a brace, you could even increase the stress at L5, because think about it, you're taking away the motion above that. And a bony union is correlated with improved outcome. So keeping kids out of sports, hoping the bone fixes itself is a good proven treatment. So what if that doesn't work? You know, we can do this open. This is the way I was trained. You open it up, put in screws, put in rods, put in hooks. There's lots of different pieces of metal for this, you know, meaning none of them work that much better than the other. You know, when, what's a counterindication? If you have a black disc that's degenerated, don't just fix the bone in the back because you could still have pain in the front. You have to do a front back fusion. 
Uh, if you have a big gap or a big listhesis, you have to do a front back fusion. Now, I want to thank my partners. I came to Cedars just about four or five years ago. You know, I was a tree hugging pediatrician, never saw a robot in my life, and all of a sudden I'm being introduced to MIS surgery. Um, so what we're going to talk about now is how to fix the spondy with MIS surgery. And first off, it's five times harder than putting in a pedicle screw, you know, using a robot to put in a spondy screw. There's a little room for error. It's super hard bone. It's like putting a screw perfectly into a knife edge. So let's look at a case. 15-year-old athlete, a year and a half of pain. This is a typical kid I see. Had pain for a year and a half, keeps getting sent to physical therapy, a little bit of patient blaming often goes on. In this kid, I got a bone scan. I get bone scans if there's a lot going on or a little going on. Generally don't because there's a lot of radiation. But I couldn't believe that those little tiny cracks were causing this kid pain. You see it's also hot in MRI. So we planned surgery on the robot. We'll be going over that. It's amazing how much planning you can do on a robot three-dimensionally. You can see in the upper right there how close those screws could come to the joint. This has to be a perfect shot. And what's kind of fun also with the robot, you can see where the skin is. You can have the skin incisions be about at the same place. You could do one incision for two screws. Now, the way that I was taught to do this is to put the reference frame in the pelvis. That's how we're all taught to do it. That's wrong. I went through a tough learning curve. I want to shorten your learning curve. Think about if you have a spondylolysis and you have that L5 gill fragment that's mobile. Why not put the reference frame on the L5 spinous process? Because that's where you're putting the screw. And, uh, Dr. Lurie had a great teaching point that we should uh, concentrate on. Even though we might do a one centimeter incision to put in the screw, we'll do a three or four or five centimeter fascial incision so the robot doesn't caught in the get caught in the fascia. Have big fascial incisions. That'll uh, send the robot in a bad direction. Oh, but just so see here as, see if I could do this correctly, as I'm dissecting the fascia, watch the L5. Uh, reference frame move. And as we tap, watch the L5 reference frame move. So that L5 fragment moves around, and as long as the reference frame is with it, we're okay. But if you have the reference frame in the pelvis, that screw can go in the wrong place. And then through a single, you know, two centimeter incision, we use something called DuraPro. We'll show that later. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Tap and screw. In general, I don't use taps. I think for pedicle screws, there is little upside and lots of downside. Taps are the most dangerous instrument in spine surgery. But for spondylolysis, it's really hard laminar bone. You have to tap. Or when you put the screw across, it could separate the fragment and make the gap bigger. I did that wrong once feel horrible. Okay, so if there's any questions, pull in fluoro, put in a guide wire, make sure you're in the right place. When I grow up, I'll learn how to spell guide wire. And then verify with fluoro and stimulate it. Just like we stimulate a pedicle screw, stimulate this. If the screw's touching the nerve, you want to know. So I use HA-coated screws on the theory that the bone's going to grow in. So we just take a typical pedicle screw, get rid of the tulip, use the shaft. And the first one I did at five weeks, I'm like, wow, look at all that haloing. Is it infected? Is it loose? Just takes a while for the HA coating to grow in. Generally grows in by nine or 10 weeks. And this first kid, for some reason, I got more CTs. And it's wonderful watching the bone grow in and the screws grow in as well. And then I would assume that this is even stronger than it was to begin with through a normal uh, spine because you have titanium across it. OK, let's talk about pitfalls. Any new surgery especially, there's lots of pitfalls. If people don't discuss them with you, don't trust them. So, you know, this is a very sharp knife edge. And when I was using the high-speed burrs, you know, like everybody uses for robots, it would literally knock the piece out of the way. I had a few screws go dorsally. I had to open up and do it by hand the old-fashioned way. There's something new out. It's called DuraPro, that's the technical uh, or the company name. What it does is vibrate 24,000 hertz, it just spins 270 degrees, and it makes a big noise. So the orthopods know this noise. It's like a cast saw. You know, we're all used to a cast saw. Big noise, scary, but it won't hurt soft tissue. Neurosurgeons aren't used to this. They're afraid of that noise. It takes them a while to get used to it. And 
We'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow in detail. It's in the lab. You could all put your hands on it. So here's another uh, thing where you could make an error. And I made an error here. You can guess what it is. And it's interesting, when you're using a robot, it seems like your typical surgery mind goes out the window because you're looking at screens, you're thinking about robots, and you can lose judgment. And here's what I did. I just kept going with the screw until I broke the guide wire. You know, that's like a rookie error I haven't made in a decade, but somehow when you're thinking about robot, you lose your mind a little bit. So remember, pull back the guide wire. And when do you bone graft? The number one predictor of healing by just putting a screw across it is it has to be hot on MRI or hot on bone scan. If it's not, you have to bone graft. And here's an example of something, big gap, wasn't hot, had to bone graft. So the setup now is we put that reference frame on L5, then make a two centimeter incision to put in the screw, put the screw in through that hole, it's a rather steep angle, you should be able to feel the screw going in and see it at the same time. Then through the screw incision, take something like an Acumed bone graft harvester, minimally invasively, go into the iliac crest, get the best bone in the human body, and the way out, fill it up with some marcane. The kids can't even tell what side it came from as long as you don't violate the cortex. Then take out the reference frame and you have a perfect hole to look at the fracture site. If you want to, you could be fancy, you could put in tubes, microscopes. You know, at any rate, you see the fracture site, you see the screw crossing it. You know, I just do it with an Army Navy, it takes about 10 minutes, throw in some bone graft, maybe some magic bone growing chemicals like BMP. And so far, I've never had one of those not heal. Uh, here's what it looks like at three months healed. You see there was a big gap there before. The gap is closed. And typically, as far as I know, I've never had one of these fails and fail and all of the pain from the spondy has gone away. There's other reasons for back pain, which we all have. And here's a kid who is a national level volleyball player. You can see the bottom middle there. We put an autograph bone graft and BMP. There's a massive amount of bone growing. Every time I give this talk, someone says, why don't you use a lag screw? And a lag screw sounds good in theory, but I've seen a number of failures done, done seen elsewhere and sent to me. I think the lag screw might apply pressure at first, but over time, not so much. I want to develop a HA-coated lag screw so you get the best of both worlds. And there's some data now, at least theoretically, that if you fix the spondy, you can help restore the forces across the disc. So that may be a reason to fix these earlier than later. Something we're about to publish is there's a drastically higher rate of dark disc, disc degeneration with spondies and especially spondylolisthesis. About a 100% rate of disc degeneration in kids if you have grade two or over spondylolisthesis. So let's talk a little bit about grade one and two spondylolisthesis. Bottom line is put an ALIF in the front, perk screws in the back. So far, I've had 100% healing with that, kids under 25. Um, T-lift sounds good in theory, works in adults. For some reason, it doesn't work in young athletes who go out and play hard. You know, I think if we're honest with ourselves, you never get quite the dissection and bony contact in a T-lift as you do an ALIF. And here's an example of a kid with the ALIF. You know, have an exposure surgeon do it. Uh, just like Rod say, it's really stress-free. Someone else has the stress. Throw in some allograft, throw in some BMP. It's crazy how quickly these have a solid fusion in young people. High-grade spondies. Here's a 15-year-old. Her goal was a gymnastic scholarship. She got to the point where she couldn't even sit up in school you know, without pain. The robots do an amazing job of planning. You can get all the screw heads lined up. Technical tip is have L5 a little bit high. I like the home run screw that goes S1 through the disc to L5. You basically get anterior support without going in the front. Uh, here's what it looks like. I just saw her yesterday, actually, four and a half years post-op. You know, really quickly, she had good motion. She got her gymnastics scholarship. Uh, no more back pain, you know, able to return to normal activities. So far, 
these people you know, get fixed and I haven't seen one of these fail. So you know, while surgeon ego wants to line the bone up on top of each other, there's a really high rate of L5 nerve root injuries. It's the only surgery in the SRS database where the complications are worsening over time because everyone gets up on stage and go, well, if you reduce it my way, you won't have a nerve root problem. And that just isn't the case. What is important is that we have L4 to S1 at least 35 degrees. You need to restore the lordosis. Um, I think if there's a little translation, it doesn't matter so much. So in my opinion, robot-assisted spondylolysis repair is a true improvement in patient care. And this is the type of thing that I hope you get to learn in your residency or fellowship. Thank you very much. Now, any questions or? Any questions for Dr. Skaggs? So yes, sir. Kids that have like a super steep NFL against this, all that sort of thing. I heard, read some people advocate to potentially reduce that. Is there any circumstance where you have to Super steep what? Oh, you said like a spondyloptosis L5 on S1? Yeah, there's no question that most spine surgeons, you know, say that you should be reducing L5 and S1. That's probably the book answer. I personally think that the risk is not worth the reward. No. You know, people love to talk about PI. I'm not sure why. You know, it doesn't change what you do. Any other questions? How yes, soon sir? are you getting them back to activity and is it graduated like school then sports etc or it doesn't matter the sport yeah per se. I like to see healing across the spondylolysis typically we do a CT scan of only that vertebrae three months out most of the time it's healed in three months sometimes it takes longer but I don't let them go back to full sports until we see bony union and actually that's another thing we should talk about if you order a CT scan of L5 only Half the time they do the entire thing. So you have to really warn the parents about that. Kieran? Two questions. Um, how long do you non off them until you indicate them for surgery? Three months, six months? I ethically just want to wait six months. You know, the studies show they're going to heal within four or five months or they're not going to heal. Um, occasionally, there's kids who are being scouted who are dying to have it fixed. You know, I feel now it's outpatient surgery, two centimeter incision. I'm able to be talked into doing it quicker now than I was before. You know, six months for a high school athlete, that's their season. Yes, and what happens if the MRI, you know, is hot at first, six months later it's not hot. You have to do more surgery. You have to bone graft. You know, simply putting a screw across a uh, bone that's trying to heal itself is pretty predictable. Um, second question, in your non-op algorithm, do you ever use a bone snip? I do use a bone stim. Um, I don't think there's good data for it. I think there's little downside other than time and money. So why not? Thank you. Thank you.